The architectural profession in America took root in the 19th century, but acquired its present form during the 20th century. Today, architects study for an average of 11 years to become licensed professionals. Typically, the architectural student's path involves five years, acquiring an architectural undergraduate degree, an additional two to three years to complete a master's degree, and a three-year professional internship beyond that. Before practicing, however, all architects must also pass a registration examination administered by the Board of the National Council of Architectural Registration. For much of the 19th century, architects working in Utah and across much of America acquired their skill set not through study, but through apprenticeships and other forms of on-the-job direct training. As we pointed out in an earlier lecture, this was true of the architects who designed even major buildings, such as the four pioneer era temples built in Utah over the course of the 19th century by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The design and construction of buildings was typically the responsibility of carpenters or bricklayers or stone carvers or other representatives of the building trades. Tradespeople, who at one time or another over the course of their career had opportunities to design buildings, could expand their professional offerings and claim the title of the architect builder. The ranks of architect builders were fortified even further by amateur architects, who were typically people who enjoyed some education, who had access to books of design, and also had connections with clients willing to engage them for either favors or fees. Joseph Don Carlos Young, a son of Brigham Young, is oftentimes called the first formally trained architect in Utah. Now, to be specific, Young was not actually trained as an architect, but as an engineer at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Young taught the first formal architectural classes ever offered in Utah at the University of Deseret over the course of the 1880s, while designing many notable buildings, including the Brigham Young Academy Building in Provo, now Provo City's library, and also the Paris Idaho Tabernacle. In the late 1880s, Young stopped teaching his architectural courses to take on the project of finishing the Salt Lake Temple, then nearing completion. From that point on in his career, Young both officially as well as unofficially served as the LDS church architect, leaving space for other architects to come to Utah and take on the burgeoning business, residential, and institutional design projects that as Utah grew in population and developed economically came to be increasingly in demand. The arrival of the railroad to Utah in 1869 proved to be the catalyst of local change in so many ways. And the railroad was certainly a major force that changed the story of Utah architecture. The railroad made Utah accessible to new ideas, even ideas about architecture, such as those published in builders journals and other types of periodicals. And the railroad also opened up Utah to new products and building materials that were offered in publications like the Montgomery Ward and Company catalog. The railroad further opened Utah up to new peoples. Utah's population more than doubled between 1880 and 1890, from 21,000 to 45,000. And by 1910, the population had yet doubled again to 93,000. By the 1880s, Salt Lake had grown to be a regional trade center and had begun to take on a permanent look with substantial downtown buildings financed by successful mining and mercantile operations. The railroad, not surprisingly, directly or indirectly, also brought members of the founding generation of Utah architects to the territory. And the rest of this lecture will primarily focus on three of these founding generation of Utah architects. Frederick Albert Hell was among the most prominent of Salt Lake City's local architects in the decades spanning the turn of the century, and his work is representative of the professional architect of his time. In contrast to the earlier architect builder, Hell had professional training in architecture and made his living by designing buildings rather than designing and then actually building them. Hell was born in Rochester, New York in 1855 and attended school there. Hell also spent his summers in and around Rochester as a youth working for two local architects. When he was 20, Hell enrolled at Cornell University where he spent two years studying architecture, after which he spent time in a variety of architectural offices and jobs, which ultimately brought him west, first to Denver and then to Salt Lake City, 
where he took on the project of designing the sadly now demolished Commercial National Bank in downtown Salt Lake City. Recognizing the opportunity to construct a thriving architectural career in the city that virtually had no other professional architects, Hell spent much of the remainder of his life in Salt Lake City constructing houses, clubs, churches, and commercial blocks for the city's influential and wealthy citizens. At one time, South Temple was lined with no less than 10 of Hell's mansions, and downtown Salt Lake City streets featured his commercial and institutional buildings at regular intervals. Hell never took on many architectural students or apprentices, which limited his local influence strictly to the buildings that he designed. The next two architects in this lecture, however, namely Richard Kledding and Walter Ware, both claim the title of Dean of Utah Architecture, due both to their wide range of architectural commissions, but also to their desire to impart their knowledge of architecture to future generations of Utah practitioners. Kletting was the son of a German railroad builder, and consequently, he spent his early years in German railroad camps. During the summers, as a young man, Kletting learned stone cutting, at 16, he became a junior draftsman in the engineering office of a German railroad. After additional drafting work, Kledding moved to Paris to work for a large construction firm. He then immigrated to the United States in 1883, visited several cities on a tour of the country, and ultimately decided to settle in Salt Lake City. Two years after his arrival, Kledding advertised his profession in the Salt Lake City directory for 1885. From then on out, Kledding was busy designing large commercial buildings, chapels for the LDS church, schools, and a variety of residences. While Kledding's most notable achievement, architecturally speaking, was winning the design competition for the Utah State Capitol, some of our most favorite Kledding design buildings included his recreational pavilions, such as Salt Air, and a large and very elaborate dancing pavilion, which was constructed at what is now called Lagoon. Aside from training many of Utah's future architects in his office, Kledding also taught classes out of his Avenue's home to what we imagine were very eager students. Currently, a group of Utah architectural historians are writing a study of Kledding's work, and we very eagerly anticipate the release of this publication. Like his colleague Richard Kledding, Walter E. Ware was also associated in his early years with the railroad. After completing high school in his home state of Massachusetts, Ware went to work in an architect's office and later in the Union Pacific Drafting Offices where he designed several buildings for that railroad. Ware eventually opened an office in Salt Lake City around 1891 and practiced architecture out of Salt Lake for nearly 60 years from 1891 to 1949. Here we see Walter Ware on the left side of this photo with his longtime partner Ware and Treganza and a variety of architectural draftsmen who worked out of Walter Ware's firm. Walter Ware's early residential work exhibited typically late Victorian massing and ornamentation. However, the scope of Ware's practice, as well as his designs, changed as he took on various partners over the course of his long professional life. One of the longest of these partnerships was with Alberto Otraganza, a Californian influenced by craftsmen, Tudor, Spanish Revival, and at times classical architecture. Together, Ware and Traganza brought a tremendous amount of style architecturally to the state of Utah. Due to conflicts within their partnership, however, Ware and Traganza dissolved their architectural firm in the early 1920s. Ware's last major partnership from 1938 to 1949 was with Floyd McCallaghan. Ware, like Cletting, very much deserves a book that delves more specifically into his work, his partnerships, and his general contribution to Utah's architecture. And we hope that someday somebody will write such a book. This concludes our sixth lecture in this seven lecture series on Utah's architectural history. At this point, we very much want to thank Professor Peter Goss, a professor emeritus at the University of Utah, who provided much of the material for this lecture. As always, we also wish to thank Preservation Utah's members for their support. If you have not yet joined Preservation Utah, we very much encourage you to do so today. Again, thank you for tuning in and thank you for your support. Mm -hmm.